Okay. Caleb, what's Excellent. up, brother? Great to see you for another Ask Me Anything. Tripping all over each other already, man. We're starting off strong here. <laughs> it's How good. You, always good. We're going to field questions from Instagram today. Always a kind of a different audience, yeah? I think so. I don't know. We'll see the questions. I went through them really briefly. I was traveling a lot over the past couple of days. And so yesterday I was on the plane after I had posted that. So I didn't really get a good chance to see the questions. So we'll see. We'll see how the audience is over on the gram. On the gram. All right. So headlines, you want to kick us off? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that for a second. Uh Um, I actually don't have a specific headline. I have a group of headlines, more so a trend. And, And I don't know... If this is something that I see because of my Instagram algorithm and my social media feeds, or if it's more prevalent, or we just see it more because we have access to cameras and videos, but I see an insane amount of young people fighting and bullying and just causing mayhem unlike I've ever seen. And I'm cautious because I don't want to sound like the quintessential old guy who says, you know, kids these days, but I think we're seeing a real problem. I watched a video, I think it was a couple of weeks ago of a brawl between two girls and guys and everybody in the street. And this girl, she's 15 years old, got into a fight with another one and, you know, fighting happens that takes place. I don't think it happens as often with, with girls, but we see that more and more often, but she smashed her head into the concrete And I I don't, I don't have an update on that. I don't know if that girl died or not, but I would not be, I knew that, but I didn't know if she passed away or not. But you see that, you see bullying, you see people getting picked on, you see these fights taking place. And I just can't help but think that this is a major problem with the degeneracy in society. I remember years and years ago, we had Colonel Dave Grossman on, uh, and, and the podcast was, or his book was on killing and on combat. Those are his two most popular books. And we talked about the rise of violence. And I had a bunch of people at the time, this was probably maybe five, six years ago, say, oh, you know, if you look at the statistics, and I don't actually know, maybe I should should look into that a little bit more, but at least on an anecdotal level, I think we're seeing a rising level of violence uh, than ever before. And the reason for that, I have some theories here. When we paint people as victims, certain classes, whether it's based on race or gender or sexual identity or sexual orientation, and we paint those individuals as victims, then it gives them the right to quote unquote, defend and stick up for themselves. Because everybody is not just another person. They're a perpetrator of violence against that victim class. Not everybody is a victim. There are victims, but I don't think we do genuine victims justice when we paint everybody a victim based on, again, immutable characteristics. So we have to be very, very careful of that. There's also a passivity in society today that allows this to take place. I think we live in probably, if we look historically, the safest time in human history. The odds of us having to defend ourselves, the odds of us facing a violent encounter are probably significantly lower than they ever have been in the history of humankind. That said, we've created this ease of modernity where we can just hug it out and be friends and not have these issues. And what it's created is a group of passive, weak, pathetic human beings So when there's actually a person who wants to perpetrate violence against another person, nobody knows how to stand up against it because they've never had to confront it. They've never had to deal with it. And they've never been in that type of situation. We have so many anti-bullying campaigns and let's hug it out and let's be friends. And can't we all get along and the coexist bumper stickers that you see on everybody's car. And yet we continue to see these problems, especially with school age children It's going to be a problem. So on the micro, at least in your own situation, get your kids trained up. Hmm. Teach them to be aware. Teach them to take initiative. Teach them to be assertive. Teach them to stand up for themselves. Teach them to protect themselves and other people who can't protect themselves. Because the last thing you'd want to do is send your child to school one day and then him or her get into a fight and get her head slammed against the road 
And all of a sudden you get a phone call at 11 o'clock in the morning saying your daughter or son is in critical condition fighting for their life. It's becoming a real possibility. And I think it's going to get worse as we continue this de de degeneracy in society today. So obviously we're addressing the, the greater issues, which is men stepping up as men and being responsible and leading. But on the micro, make sure your kids are taken care of, make sure they're trained up and make sure they're aware of what's happening and the risk they're, they're uh, stepping into when they go out outside of your house. I find it interesting. Try this on for thought and let me know what, you're, what you think. But by making words violent, then it allows or it opens up for violence to occur, right? So if you and I say, oh, well, if you say rude things to Kip, that's considered violent. It then allows me to violently, physically violent, justify my physical violence with your words of violence. And it muddies the water of what is violent and what is not. And, and I totally agree. I, I don't think we have enough examples of people disagreeing and arguing and 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 we've almost denormalized it to the extent that if if people disagree with each other it's it's now this extreme thing and now it's a violent thing versus no we just disagree and so people jump to violence because we're not even seeing it as a as a common thread and that it's okay that you don't agree with people and we don't encourage it enough there's a quote, and I'm going to butcher it here, but it's something like the mark of an intelligent man is his ability to entertain an idea without accepting it. Yeah. We just need to entertain the idea. If I, if I listen to you, you talked about this on Tucker's interview with Putin. If I listen to it, I'm not accepting it. I'm entertaining it. I'm, yeah. I'm curious what makes a person like that tick so that I can make my my own decisions in life. But I wrote this here as you were talking about the words or violence. You know what the interesting thing about it is? Silence is also violence. Hmm. Right? You hear that. Words are violent. Oh, he did this. That was violence perpetrated against me. But also, if you don't say anything, silence is violence. Yeah. Well, okay. What are, what are we training our kids to do? To be quiet, yeah. to not speak up, to not go out of turn to not have a thought or an idea that deviates from the doctrine of popular culture. And it's no wonder that we have bullies and violent people who just push others around because they're not any righteous no, people anything. to stand up against it. They're all too afraid. Totally. Totally. I love that you chose this headline because it's actually perfectly aligned. I promise guys, we, we didn't discuss this ahead of time to try to, you know, see if we get a line on our headlines, but I, but it's very much in line with the same concept, maybe a different angle. So the headline I snagged this past week that I saw was that Tyson's, th this is how the headline read Tyson foods fires, hardworking American employees and instead hires illegal immigrants. Mm. Okay. I saw that. Now we could jump all over that, make this soapbox about how uh, that's un-American. We need to close the border and we need to protect American jobs. Like we can go all that route, but I don't want to. And this is why I don't. Because if, if we moan and complain about how that's unfair to the American person, who is in control? Who do you need to rescue you to make sure you save your job? You or someone else? And this is the other angle by which we will perpetuate a victim mindset. And you mentioned this earlier, Ryan, about, you know, there are victims. There absolutely are victims, absolutely. But by maintaining a victim mindset, you are not in a position of empowerment, you will not learn, and you will not grow. Absolutely. So even, I, I would even say if someone's listening, they're like, well, I was a victim. I don't give a shit, actually. Awesome, you're a victim. <laughs> What are you going to do about it? You can continue to relinquish your power over to someone else and continue to be a victim, or you can do something about it. And so when I hear this headline, I can't help but think of all the Americans that jump onto the, on the victim train going up, oh, see, still in our jobs, right? Um, uh, we need to elect our officials, our uh, we need a better president to rescue me, to, to save me, 
to save my job from it being stolen by illegal immigrants. And I would suggest that if we are ever in a position where we are waiting and hoping for someone else to do something for our behalf, you are being a victim. You're not in a position of empowerment and you will continually be acted upon. Now, let me just explain that briefly, just to kind of drive this thought home. If it gets fixed, who fixed it for me? You? No, someone else did. Which means that the next time some illegal group wants to steal your job, what are you going to do? Look for your savior to rescue you. Once again, your politician, your someone else versus you taking ownership and figuring out how do you ensure that you are a valuable asset so much that if another group that is cheaper labor doesn't threaten your job. That is how you step into a position of ownership or a position of empowerment. I've had this thought, and we get this a lot every so often on the podcast around guys that, and I don't, I don't know how to have a phrase for it, but they're the kind of guys that are like, on paper, Ryan, life's great. I got a good wife. I got a good job. My kids are healthy, but I just lack something. What it is, I would suggest, is that you are living a life of victimhood and your rescuers are just really good at their job. And your life is easy peasy and things are going well or whatever, but they're going well, not because of anything or not mostly because of your own actions, but because of other people. And because of that, we lack fulfillment, meaning and purpose when the byproduct of our lives is not through our autonomy and through our, our, our own decisions and it doesn't include challenges and difficulties. And so we find ourselves, maybe life's going great, but we lack something. And I would argue that anyone listening that kind of might feel that way, like on paper, life seems great. It's because you're playing small and life is going great because of other people more than it is about you stepping into what where what you need to do um, as a man. So there's there's my thoughts. I don't want to jump onto the the victim train of illegal immigrants still in American jobs. That's another conversation, absolutely. But let's step into a position of empowerment and say, well, what are you going to do about it, and not wait for someone else well, to do something about it. And that's all you can do, right? I mean, absolutely. So when you said that, my blood is boiling a little bit, and I'm like wanting to jump in because yeah, I, I don't I think it's tell. the victim train. <laughs> I don't think it's the victim train to state the obvious. I, I don't think it's the victim train to ask the government to do explicitly what it's intended to do, to level the playing field, to keep our sovereign country secure and safe and protected. One of the major reasons that these organizations can outsource this way is because other countries are cheating. China, for example, is cheating. They're stealing our technology. They're, they're undercutting prices and then everything gets shipped overseas. That's not a level playing field. And so we should be aware of that. And I think right. when you're talking about this, the disclaimer I would put out there is we could start tiptoeing into false dichotomies here. Either you can do something about it or you can complain about it. And I don't think it's either. And yeah. I don't think you do either. No. Is that we need to be aware of that and be elected into positions of, of power and authority so we can begin to implement these changes at the state, local, federal levels. And also, to your point, focus on the controllables, which is how do I develop a new skill set? How do I make myself more valuable in my work environment? How do I offer more value to my clientele so that they will not be tempted to do these things, um, you know, and, and start thinking about what you can do as well. So I, I think both exist. And, and I, again, you do as well. You're just addressing one side of it. Yeah, absolutely. And we have to keep in mind, like even from a leadership perspective, I often have two different conversations, right? I, I might meet with a director and he might be complaining, let's say around something that the executive suite or the C-suite is doing. And I might totally agree, but I don't go into that conversation saying, you know what, Ryan, I totally agree. Yeah, that's really tough. They need to change the way they're being. No, I go, awesome, Ryan, what are you doing about it? 
How do you build right. confidence? How do you earn trust? And then I might leave the conversation going, yeah, Ryan's totally right about those guys. <laughs> and I need to have another conversation with them. But that's, but I'm not going to just pander to your complaint and go, yeah, you're right, man. Let's, let's wait for something to be fixed somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. That needs to be fixed somewhere else. But what are you also going to do about it right now? What's within sure. your realm of control and how do you step into a position of empowerment? Yeah. 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 I like it. All right, man, cool. let's get to some questions. Yeah. So we're going to have a couple questions from Facebook and then we'll jump on to the gram. Joshua Chambers. Oh, hey, oh go can, ahead. Can I say one other thing before we get started? Yeah. When, when we were talking about righteous people doing righteous things, I think this applies to both of our headlines. And I made a note here is that righteousness is only righteousness in action. You can't exclusively think about being righteous without acting upon it because that isn't the complete sentiment. So for example, if you think to yourself, well, I'm a good person. Okay. Show me what good you've done. Yeah. Well, I care about poor people. Okay. Show me what charities you've donated to, what organizations you've contributed to, yeah. how much money you've given, what time and have you given? If you just say, Hey, I care about people. That doesn't mean anything. What is actually righteous is you going to do something about it. So in the same thing in your context, if you're just complaining about it, you might have a valid complaint. It might be valid. But if that's all you're doing, you're not being a righteous man. You're just whining. Yeah. Righteousness is only righteousness in action. And that's how you know this person is truly strong or capable or good or moral or principled or whatever. Yeah. So we need to make sure we're taking action. Dude, I, I love that. In fact, I got on a soapbox yesterday um, at church, actually, around the same subject that that sometimes we will latch onto our beliefs and we're like, well, it's what you believe. And you're like, if it's true, it shows up. <laughs> Right. On the day to day. And if and it and if it doesn't show up in the day to day, you have to question yourself, is it true? Or is it just a complaint or it's just language or it's just a facade? And if it's not driving action, you have to question that. Yeah. Well, it's it's my my girlfriend and I were talking over the over last week and she had said something. I can't remember how we got talking about it, but she had said you know, it's, it's interesting to see people who are, who say they're fit and they're eating right and they've got all their diet and nutrition locked in and they're working out. And then you look at them and they're 50 pounds overweight. It's like, okay, well, where's the discrepancy? <laughs> like you're not fooling anyone here Yeah. or your bank account. People say, oh, I'm, I'm frugal. I'm prudent. I'm good with my money. Show me your bank account. Yeah. Well, I'm upside down. You know, I've got <laughs> debt up to my eyeballs. Okay. Then you're not good with your money. And it's fine for now, but don't let it continue to be that way. Do something about it. And I know results take time. So sometimes you may have dug yourself into a hole from a health perspective or a financial out. perspective, yeah. but I should be able to see progress from last month to this month. And if I don't, then you should be questioning it a little you're bit. You're only talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All right. absolutely. Questions. All right. Facebook, that's facebook.com slash group slash order man. If you want to join us there, Joshua Chambers, I find myself struggling to plan out my days. I've experimented with time blocking, but then feel like my whole day gets filled with tasks and no time to take a break <clears throat> or a breath, I should say. But when I try to plan my day with objectives, I find that I never change or never manage to complete all the things uh, because of time management. Is there a happy middle ground? I've always been in a disorganized person <laughs> and I really want to make sure I can plan out my days effectively to get the most done without also feeling like my everyday is nothing but lists. Yeah, well, I operate best under lists, so I don't really like totally resonate with the question, but we can answer it in the spirit in which it's asked. I don't know if it's a time management issue. I think it might be a task management issue just based on the limited information I'm getting from you. Cause it sounds like you're kicking ass. Yeah. I've got a list. I'm doing everything and I don't have enough time. And like, I, you know, I, I don't have a time to take a break or if I do take a break, I don't get enough done. It sounds like you're pretty motivated to get it done. I think you might be doing too much actually. Mm. You're not going to hear that often, but I think you might be doing too much of the wrong thing. And that's what you need to do. You need to prioritize when I look. So I've got my task list because I operate on lists. So I've got my battle planner here in my hand 
And what I'll do is I'll look at my objectives and what I need to accomplish. And then I'll break it down into tasks that I need to complete on a, on a daily basis. And, uh, Kip, when you messaged me, you were running a little bit late for the podcast today. Um, and so I could have taken 10 minutes and, you know, jumped on Facebook or social media or, you know, done whatever it is I was going to do. Instead, I jumped to my task list and I said, what can I get done in 10 minutes? And I've been gone for the past couple of weeks and, uh, I've, I've got really behind on emails. So I cranked out about 70 emails in 10 minutes. Some of them were spam, some of them auto responses, some of them just, you know, just a quick yes or no, or thank you. And I, I went through about 70 emails in that time frame because I have a list. I do like the idea of planning in breaks because you need those breaks and you can take those breaks, not in the middle of tasks, but once you complete a task, because if you do it in the middle of task, you're going to lose more time because when you wind down to, let's say, go to the bathroom and you come back, you don't just come back to where you were. You have to get into the feel of it. You have to get back into the rhythm and it takes longer to get started back up. So take your breaks after tasks are complete or at a good stopping point anyways, before you start a new task. Um, I don't know that there's a happy medium. I think the best thing that you can do is prioritize what needs to get done and know that not everything's going to get accomplished. I don't know that I've ever completed any, everything on my to-do list in a day. I don't think I have. Yeah. If I have, it's, it's very rare, but what I do is I roll it over to the next day and something else might take precedent between five o'clock tonight and five o'clock tomorrow morning. I plug it in and I reprioritize every day. In fact, I'm prioritizing when I'm done with a task. When I'm done with this podcast with you, Kip, something else might come up in the hour that we're talking and that might need my attention. And so I'll plug that into the list of things that I need to accomplish. But I, I've, I'm on this kick of just not burning myself out. Yeah. You know, I, you can see this in the gym a lot. You'll see a guy who hasn't been to the gym for a while and he'll go in and he'll just bust his ass for like a week And then he's tired, he's exhausted, his muscles are sore, he's burnt out, he hates everything he's doing, he feels like garbage. And then week two comes around and he's not there. Yeah. I'd rather you go three days this week and go three days next week and the next week and the next week than five or seven or two times a day for five and then not at all for the next three weeks. Keep yourself in the game, gentlemen, and that requires pacing. We talked about that either last week or the week before pace yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And give yourself that margin. And a lot of guys that feel like they're overwhelmed, this is the power of prioritizing and executing. That's all you can do. That's what I tell employees all the time. I feel so overwhelmed. What's the top priorities? Execute on the top priorities. That's it, right? Like don't worry, you know, do your best, forget the rest, identify the top priority items, get those done. And, and, and just move on. So, and, and give yourself some margins. Now I was trying to find a quote. It was super great. I'm going to slaughter it. Not applicable to you, Josh. So, so don't, uh, don't get upset at me, but I love this quote that roughly says something to the extent that stop saying you have a time management problem. You have a self discipline mm. problem. Time is time. The problem is you're not doing the work that needs to get done. And I think that's where most of us fit, that we, we actually have a self-discipline problem and it's really not time management. Now, Josh, it sounds like you have the opposite or it sounds like you're overburning yourself and you get burnt out and then you have this unhealthy relationship with lists because you're like, oh, stupid lists. I, my whole life's driven by lists because you, you probably didn't give yourself enough margin and you're just overdoing it, and then you get disenfranchised with it. But for a lot of people, we're talking about a self-discipline problem, um, yeah. not time management. It's funny when you say that. I wrote this down: is why? Why do I make a thousand dollars an hour, and Elon Musk makes a hundred thousand an hour? Those are arbitrary numbers. But why is that the case? Same hour, yeah. he's doing more valuable things. That's it. And, and people say, oh, I'm valuable to work. That's not what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. He's doing more valuable things as the market dictates. Is that the only metric of value in a man's life? No, but it's the one we're looking at right now. Yeah. So if you want to be more productive, then do more valuable things. And so 
to your point about prioritization, what is the most valuable thing for you to be doing right now? Sometimes that's emails. Sometimes that's sales calls. Sometimes that's actually putting together a plan. Sometimes that's training. You know, you need to go train on how to be a better salesman, for example. But you always need to be looking at what is going to increase your productivity in the same amount of time that it did prior to you getting that training or taking that action. Yeah. Bob Ross, I find my son, seven years, seven years old, likes to question me more and push boundaries more than he does with his mother. He often refers to me as the strongest man in the world, and I feel like he's pushing boundaries in his way of trying to grow into his own man, but there are times that it becomes very frustrating to me. My wife feels this is typical and is to be expected as he attempts to grow into a young man. Have you felt this? And if so, how do you keep your calm and guide him in the right direction? Thanks for all you do. Uh, I learned this in talking about sales training. The person asking the question is the one who's in control of the conversation. So if he's asking you questions, he's in control of the conversation. It's not bad. It just is. He's yeah. dictating the conversation. Ask him questions back. So when he says, hey, dad, why do you do that? Well, that's a good question, son. Why do you, why think? Do you think so? Yeah. And he might say, oh, I don't know. I never really thought about it. Well, let's, let's explore it a little bit. Right? So it's, it's good. The fact that he's asking you questions, I don't know what kind of questions he's asking, but that's a good thing. And the fact that he's trying to push back a little bit or find his own way, even at seven years old, that's great. I, I really try not to hamper that. I've done that in the past with my oldest in particular. Yeah. But the more I just let go of that a little bit and let them be their own personality, the better relationship that we have. And I think the more creative and exploratory that, that, that my children are. And, and I like it. You know, I appreciate that all of my kids are different and have different personalities and don't see things the same way that I do. But the best way to answer a question in these cases is with another question. And, and there's a line, right? Like there's a point where it becomes obnoxious and it's just manipulation. Yeah. yeah. But if he's asking you a question about, um, you know, what, why I don't even know, uh, why you're working out the way that you, what would even be a question? I don't know. What's a good example of a question you think you might ask? Well, I, I got a, I don't have a good question. I have a good example of this. Um, yeah, my, let's hear it. my daughters in their new school, they're like in a private school. And I was joking around the other day. I'm like, the drawback of that school is they've gotten really good at debating, mm. <laughs> which comes at a price, right? So my daughter, no joke, wants a dog. What ends up happening? I have pictures all over the house of this random dog that she wants, softening <laughs> me up, right? These cute photos of this, of this puppy, writes a multi-page report of the benefits of having a puppy in the house. She's pulling stats from online about my longevity. Like I will live longer, like statistically I'll live longer if, if we have two dogs That's versus funny. one, like she's working angles all over the place, talking to mom, talking to me. My other daughter built a PowerPoint presentation I had to come home and watch this presentation about her getting a phone, <laughs> right? It's really tempting to be mad at it, right? And go, hey, I said no. And, and see it as a form of disrespect. But look at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're processing it. They're trying to debate. Back to your point earlier, we want people to argue. They're arguing with me in a respectable way. They're, dis they're highly disagreeing with me. And they're using <laughs> logic nice and coercion <laughs> to do it. Ah, uh, oh, I got you. I got, I'm not sure where we left off, but like, it's good Just say they're highly, say they're highly disagreeing, say they're highly disagreeing with me again. They're highly disagreeing with me. And if I look at the root of it, what an amazing skill that they're developing. So the only reason that it's frustrating is because of my ego. I don't want to be challenged and I don't want to have to deal with telling them no. It's all selfish. In the grand scheme of things, 
we should all hope that our kids are being a little bit more disagreeable in society today and that they're logically processing ways to get their, their point across. What an amazing thing, but it's a pain in the butt. So did you get another dog? Absolutely no. <laughs> and that's, that's an interesting thing too, is I think it's okay to explain. I don't, I don't like the, because I said so mentality, oh. but if you explain, Hey, Hey, look, hon, like I appreciate everything that you've done. I admire all that information that you've put together. But at the end of the day, I have to make decisions on based on what I think is the head of the household is best for the family. And so we're not going to be getting a dog <laughs> for these reasons. But I appreciate all of that effort and work and I appreciate the healthy discussion and I appreciate what you've done, but we're not doing that. Like yeah. you still have to say no. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But it's great. Yeah. Cool. Right. Yeah, it's good. All right. What's next? All right. We're going to go jump over to the gram uh, to follow uh, Ryan on Instagram. That's at Ryan Mickler. I always love Instagram because these names are all like whack. Chabo 101, whatever that means. Like they're, they're probably like <laughs> slaying naughty words or whatever, but uh, whatever. So this individual, actually not a question. He says, I heard one of your free podcasts. I didn't know they were free, by the way, um, about finding me, finding things and doing things that I was thinking about. And I did. My life has been changing and I don't really know where I'm going, but it's definitely getting better than where, what, where I was. Thank you, Ryan. So I just thought that was a, a little nice to add. Awesome. Cool. All right. To the questions. All right. Jeez. Jaw Logger 81. Dating after <laughs> divorce. The good, the bad, the ugly about it. Married 20 years and now starting over. Best places and things to do to find a new partner. Yeah, I, I've had... I've had a good experience dating. I'm, I'm dating somebody exclusively now and we have been for, for months now. And so, but, but even prior to that, I, I enjoyed dating. I didn't put a whole lot of expectation on anything. I wasn't out there trying to get laid. I wasn't trying to get married. I, I just, just wanted to date and I had a really good experience. I used, uh, online dating almost exclusively. That's easy. So easy. All you have to do is be normal. <laughs> I've heard some crazy, crazy stories about guys who are anything but I'm normal. Sure. I'll just say it that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the best thing that you can do if you want to get back into the dating market is online dating to me is, is the way to go. Obviously you need to learn how to interact with attractive women face to face as well. So what I would suggest is to look for ways to engage with women in non-threatening environments. So at work, you know, that attractive woman who works down the hall, try to engage her, like try to have a conversation. If you get on the elevator and a woman walks in, like think of something that you can say to be able to start a conversation. Now I'm not saying you're going to get a date or even want a date. It's just good practice. If you're at the grocery store and you're at the same aisle as a woman or the cashier or talk to her, like try to get her to laugh, try to have a conversation with her. The more that you practice that in non-risky, non-threatening environments, the better you will be able to communicate when you do have a date or you do find somebody who's attractive that you actually would like to potentially date. So I, I think, and by the way, don't just do it with women. Try to connect with men too. If you can strike up conversations, you're 99% ahead of anybody else because nobody else can do that. Yeah. And so I was coming back from our hunt yesterday and a woman got on the, the elevator and we had a brief conversation. She started asking about what I was doing with the cooler and hunt. she started asking me and my son questions because we're able to strike up a conversation. Like the better you get at that, the better off you'll be. So that's what I would do in the real world, real world in the digital world, get a good picture taken, like hire a photographer and get some lifestyle pictures taken of yourself. Okay. Don't just, do the one in the bathroom or like whatever, like this, like present yourself in a, in a healthy, good way. Like put your best foot. If you're serious about it, put your best foot forward. So hire a photographer or look for good pictures or ask other women in your life who you're not attracted to say, Hey, like I'm getting into dating. What do you think about these pictures? Like be honest. 
And let her be honest with you. That one, you look weird. That one's a bad angle, but those two look really good. And then use the two that she suggested. Set up a good profile. And then here's the biggest thing with online dating, I would say. And this is something I hear a lot is guys just, they don't, they don't know how to land the date because they don't ever ask for it. Hmm. So they'll, they'll get on the app and they'll just talk to a, a woman for days and weeks at a time. It's like, bro, the point is to get a date. Like stop revealing all of your life's experiences and stop asking about all of hers. Like just get to the point where you can get a date. And the beautiful thing about online dating is that's what you're there to do. And also guys, that's what she's there to do. She wants to go out. It's a given. So it's so easy. So all you have to do is say, Hey, you know, I'd like to take you out. And then what I would suggest on the taking out is you come up with a plan and let her say no, if she's not interested, but don't, don't ever, ever say, Hey, you know, I'd like to take you out this Friday. And she says, yeah, let's do it. And you say, great. What would you like to do? boring, lame. You just shot yourself in the foot. Now you're not assertive. She's making decisions all day anyways at work or at home or with her kids. And now you're asking her to make another decision. That's not what a man does. A man says, Hey, I'd like to take you out Friday. There's this new restaurant I want to take you to, or there's this cool concert that, you know, you and I had talked about that you said you really liked in in our text that they're actually playing, uh, you know, tonight, whatever, like make a date, plan it, and be assertive. And, uh, you know, whether you go pick her up or meet her there, I don't know. Like, I, I would suggest, again, I think it's different depending on maybe where you live. But um, I, I like picking a woman up for a date that maybe I'm just more traditional. And so I, I would say that I'd like to pick you up. But if you'd rather meet, I understand. And that's fine, too. I let them make that decision. But I plan it. And if they don't want to do it, then they can tell me. But I plan it on something that I think they would like based on the conversations we've had leading up to that point. Got it. You mentioned it briefly about mindset. Maybe share a little bit about guys looking at dating from a more of a desperate perspective and looking for something and, and what kind of mindset would be beneficial? Well, I mean, you could find that too if you want it, right? I mean, if, if you just want to go out there and get laid, you know, there's apps. Tinder is obviously notorious for that. There's apps that you, you can go do that. You know, I, I, I don't think that's a healthy way to approach it, but you know, who am I to say what you ought to be doing? Uh, I think the mindset is don't go into a date. If you're looking for an actual date with somebody to build, build and develop a relationship, I wouldn't go in with expectations of, of anything. You know, if you're, if you're going to take a woman out, don't expect that she's your next girlfriend. Don't expect that she's the next wife. Don't expect that you're going to get lucky tonight. Just don't expect any of that because what ends up happening is you put so much pressure on yourself to perform that it just comes across as, as desperate to your point. It's just, it's repulsive. So instead of that, the expectation should be, I think to enjoy enjoy her company. (laughs) That's it. Like I'm here to enjoy your company. And I went on a, I went on a handful of dates where, you know, I enjoyed it, but it, that's it. Don't, no attraction, no desire to have a follow-up date. Um, but there wasn't any weird sense of expectation or obligation. And so, um, you know, I said, I said goodbye after dinner. And that's another thing is don't plan out everything. Just plan out dinner because I don't want to be trapped all night long with somebody that I'm not interested in, but I could do dinner. Yeah. I, I, I would suggest you pay for the meal. You asked her out. You should pay for it. That's something I would suggest. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, a day or two later, I, I would, I would even the, with the women that I dated that I didn't feel like there was any connection. I said, Hey, look, really appreciate it going out with you. I didn't feel the connection that I was looking for, but I appreciated our time together and I wish you, wish you the best. Black and white. I mean, I didn't have, I didn't have, and it wasn't a lot. There's maybe you know, three or four, but I didn't have anybody like get mad that I said, no, they were like, Oh, thank you for telling me. I had a couple of them said, yeah, I felt the same way. It's fine. Like no connection. It's not a big deal to me. So yeah, I think having the right mindset is obviously going to, the ironic thing is, is you're more likely to get what you want when you don't act like you want it. It's weird, but welcome to dating. Yeah. And that's one other thing I would say about it. A lot of guys 
will say, oh, dating in the modern world sucks because women are different. I think, yeah, women can be different, but also the amount of men who take initiative, who are assertive, who are strong and capable and want to lead like men are so few and far between that if you do those things, you are really going to stand out as somebody that she at least at a minimum respects. Maybe not any further than that, you know, that's to be determined, but at least she respects that. Yeah, I see that. Soli casts, why are there so many men posting about broken relationships in, or, in the Order of Man Facebook group and equally as many telling the poster to lead the women because she must be cheating? He says, I eventually left the group because it was so repetitive. I... I actually like this conversation because I think there's a lot that you can share, Ryan, around maybe why we see so many broken relationships, but also the role that men play with one another, <laughs> you know, and, and the idea that by default, a lot of these guys are kind of like, dude, she must be cheating on you and just exit. Right. And some of the maybe the pros and cons of, of those kind of interactions that we see on the on the Facebook group. Yeah. I mean, I've even asked questions. Somebody will say, Hey, I'm having a hard time with my wife and this is what's going on. And I think she's seen another guy. And I'll ask a question like, why do you think that? Or if she is, what, like what, what drove her away? I'll say things like that. And guys are like, what does it, does it matter? Doesn't effing matter. Like, why would you even ask that? I'm like, calm down. Yeah. Like take a breath for a second. Okay. Like clearly you've been cheated on and now you're projecting all over this guy. Just calm down. Totally. We're just asking questions to get to the root of the problem. We're just exploring. And that's, that's one of the greatest problems with social media is everybody just wants to rush in and give their answer and appear yeah. smart and come in and be the hero. Like maybe she's cheating. I don't know. All I, the only information I have is the five sentences this guy wrote on Facebook. Like, I don't know what's going on. I want to be helpful. And so I'm going to ask a few questions to try to get to the bottom of it and see if there's anything we can do about it. Yeah, there are a lot of broken relationships. You know, I came out of one. And so that, that's something that I ha have dealt with. Um, and so a lot of guys are, are dealing with that. And clearly when people are struggling, that's when they're going to reach out for help. Like nobody's guys aren't going to reach out in a Facebook group when everything's going well. It's just <laughs> right. The, so totally. you're already, you're already, it's a little bit of confirmation bias. Yeah. It's people are there because they're struggling and because they're struggling, they're going to ask questions with regards to what they're struggling with. It's relationships, money, fitness, all the things that we address and talk about on a daily basis because they're things that guys are struggling with when things are going well, nobody's, jumping into a men's Facebook group about how to improve their lives, yeah. they're locked. So we've already got a bit of bias in the, in the data, right? So yeah. that's part of it. As far as why guys rush in to say things like that, it's because they're projecting. They're hurt, they're damaged, they're taking their experience and projecting it onto somebody else. Now, in some cases, they might be right. And so we need to weigh and consider. And in other cases, they're just absolutely wrong. So you need to weigh and consider. But I see a lot of guys who get hurt in isolated situations with relationships, for example. Maybe they get stepped out on. And all of a sudden, every woman is a bitch. Every woman is a gold digger. Every woman just, you know, is going to love you and leave you. Every woman's always looking for the next dude to lay with. Like, all, all women are like that. Because you were with one that was like that. I don't think all women are like that. I think there are women like that. And I think there are men like that, but I don't think all men are like that. I don't think all women are like that. So each individual case is a different scenario, which is why we ask questions because we need to really figure out if this is what's going on or not. So discernment, I guess is the answer. Exercise some discernment. You know, if somebody says, Oh, she's a bitch. She's cheating on you. <sighs> Exercise some discernment. It gives the guy right. He might be right based on the evidence. Let's look into it. Yeah. He might be wrong. Well, well, and there's a, there's a lemma level of rescuing that might occur there as well. What I like about your example of the question of like, well, why do you think that that is helping him self-evaluate and work through possible considerations for himself that will coach and help someone way better 
even if you're right. <laughs> and you could jump to the conclusion of like, oh, she's cheating, that's why, and just move on. Who didn't learn as much in that circumstance? The person that you just gave the answer to. So ask the question. Help them self-evaluate and look through the process. There's more growth. That's the coaching is around helping the individual, not just giving them the answer, right? There's a, there's a level of yeah. teaching how to fish versus giving them fish in how we interact with people when they're struggling. And that's what I saw. Well, that you one did. question, well, and one question we get quite often is something like this. My wife cheated on me. She admitted to cheating on me and I'm broken. I'm devastated. I'm heartbroken. Obviously, of course. Yeah. And I don't know what to do. What do you get? What do you guys think I should do? I can't answer that question. Who, who am I to tell you what to do? I, or, I know men, know her. close yeah. personal friends in my life who have been cheated on and have left. And I have close personal friends who have been cheated on who have stayed and they have good marriages now. I can't tell you. So in that instance, I might say something like, well, what do you think you should do? And why? And I'll have guys who jump in and be like, it doesn't matter. She cheated. It's like, that's your life, buddy. That's your decision. This guy's decision might be something else. Let's help him. Okay. We don't know all the facts. We want to see if he can come to his own conclusions. And a lot of the times they do. They're like, yeah, well, I think I, I think at a minimum I should, you know, take a break or what? Right. Okay, good. Why do you think that? Let to your point, let them work through the process. And some guys will say, well, if you didn't, if you knew the answer, he wouldn't be asking. I didn't say he knew the answer. I said, what do you think you should do? I don't think he knows the answer unequivocally. I think he's trying to work through it and I'm trying to assist him in that path. And don't let him be lazy by giving him the answer. Cause that's the other thing is that we know this. Some guys want you to tell them the answer. Why? Because they don't want to think critically. Well, guess what? There's no growth in that. So don't give them the answer. Well, and have and you ever been wrong when somebody comes back to you and says, well, you told me to do that. Yeah. What are yeah. you? Five? You're a grown ass man. Make your own decisions. Yeah. Totally. All right. Captain McClain. Dude, this dude like threw in like 40 questions. So, uh, right, but I grabbed the best one. one. I saw that. Yeah, I, I think I think this is the best one. When was the last time you lost your anger, and what do you what did you learn after reflection? Put you on the spot. It's here. actually been a long. No, I know. I'm trying to think. The last time I've I lost my anger or or got angry is that lost yeah. my temper? Is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, lost your temper. Temper. Yeah. Um. And I don't, maybe that's a spectrum in itself, right? Like, cause if you're struggling I mean, I've got last like time, snappy. I'm like, oh, what's your level of anger that you're going for here? Yeah. I, you know, I will say this, I get impatient and frustrated with my kids at times, but the common theme with that is usually when I'm stressed or pressed for time. <clears throat> yeah. I get, I get impatient. I get temperamental. I get snappy. And so I have to be really aware of how I use my time when I'm with them. Cause I'm with them half the time. So when I'm with them, um, I shouldn't be working and other things that are keeping me distracted or stressed out, I try to get all my work done. So when I'm there, I'm fully present. It's when I'm pressed for time or stressed, I'll snap at my kids. I wouldn't say I lose my temper, but I might say like, I might be a little bit more harsh in my delivery of certain things. Right. But it's actually been a long time. I mean, maybe a year, year and a half. I'll tell you what, when I was drinking heavy, I would lose my temper. But when I stopped drinking, a lot of that went away. And I've done a lot of work too on myself in, you actually come to mind a lot when situations happen that I don't like, or I'm not comfortable with. Um, I ask myself, because you suggest this, what am I making this mean? And so I get mad about something or frustrated or I feel slighted about something. And then I hear your voice. What are you making this mean? Cause you're making up a story. It, it might be right, but it might be wrong. So let's not jump to conclusions and paint the worst possible scenario and think that that person's trying to slightly slight you or trying to get you or whatever. Yeah. That has been really, really valuable. And then 
And then just understanding like, what is my objective? Right. If, if for, with my kids, for example, if I lose my temper with my kids, does that serve my objective? Well, my objective is to connect like to form deep connections with my kids so I can help them grow into self-sustaining adults. Like that's what I want. So does yelling at them achieve that objective? No, it undermines it. You know, if we're talking about my girlfriend and I, my objective is to build a healthy, loving relationship with her. If I lose my cool or lose my patience or snap at her or yell at her, does that help? develop and build the loving relationship that I want? No, it hinders it. So I'm always trying to keep in mind, like, what is my ultimate objective and what is the best way to make that happen? And it's certainly not losing my temper. Yeah. So I mean, I'm sorry, I can't give you a specific example. It's just been a really long time, which is actually kind of nice to think about. Yeah, man. I, um, I don't know if I really lose my, I mean, I'll, I'll get snippy and yell at kids and stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. Random kids or yeah, any kid walking by just <laughs> you're trip like, them. You're like, I just yell at kids. <laughs> hey, kid, come here. <laughs> um, at nighttime before we go to bed, we'll say best thing, worst thing, and I've I've convinced the kids kind of that we don't say worst thing, we say lessons learned. Mm. So, what's the best thing about your day? but something you learned today. Cause the learn thing is usually the worst thing, <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. this bad thing happened. Okay, great. What did you learn about it? And for a while there, the five-year-old was constant, constantly like best thing today. And my worst thing, dad got mad at me. <laughs> and he would say it a lot. Dad got mad at me. Dad got mad at me. Dad yelled at me. And at first, I would reply like, no, I didn't. And I'd argue <laughs> with him. And I was like, that's his interpretation, right? That's his reality. His reality is I'm mad at him, period. Whether I was or not, that's his world. And I'm like, no, it's got to change. And most importantly, that he would hold on to that. And that when he reflected on his day, the worst part about his day was me mm. right so luckily i can say i'm going to report back he hasn't said that for a long time it's been awesome it's probably been three weeks or even longer than he said now every so often i'll get a dad got mad at me today um but it's usually a result of me multitasking I'm yep. trying to do something. I'm trying to do email. I'm trying to get something else done. And I'm trying to be a present father at the same time. And I don't know why I keep trying that sometimes because that shit never works ever. <laughs> um, but it's usually a result of me multitasking versus being clear to my objective, which I really like that, Ryan. Like, what's my objective here? And uh, me multitasking usually is out of alignment with what I'm trying to accomplish as a, as a father usually. Yeah. Now I can also the say other... I've gotten better at apologizing. So I will go out of my way and grab my son and I usually make it fairly quick and have him come back to my room or whatever, sit on the couch, make eye contact with me and I'll apologize, say, hey. and not a, I was mad at you because you, none of that. Hey, I overreacted. I shouldn't have been mean. That wasn't right. I'm sorry. And just leave it as that. No story, right? In my apology to him. Yeah. No, that's awesome. You know, the other thing I was thinking is that in each of these moments, you know, we could blow it, we can keep it neutral, or we can improve the relationship. And, and, I, and I've tried to focus a little bit more heavily lately on what opportunity is being presented here. Mm. And so... When I was, when I was drinking heavy, like my kids did not like me. I thought they did. And I thought for the most part they did. I thought things were good, but like in talking with them and, and looking at the way I was showing up, they, they, they had a hard time. And so there's been over the past year and a half to two years, there's been a lot of rebuilding in the relationships. Um, and there's been moments and I can't think of a specific, but there's been moments where there might be some contention or frustration on my part with something. And 
I can get frustrated. I can blow up or I can ignore or whatever. Or I can say, well, here's an opportunity for me to show them that two years ago I would have done this. But in the exact same scenario today, whoa, look how dad just handled that. And that says something about me, which builds the relationship. Another example is uh, about a week ago, uh, my girlfriend and I went hunting. I think I talked a little bit about that. Well, on the way back, we, we, had a, we, had, we had some friction. I'll say it that way. We had some friction. And uh, it, was an, it, it, it actually worked out. Like It was tense for a little bit there. But I could have blown up. I was dealing with my own personal stuff. She was de- and then just conf- conflict. I could have blown up. I could have got frustrated. I could have said things. She could have said things like there could have, it could have been way worse. Instead, we both took a break, took a breather, you know, the next morning it was fine. Like it was fine. We talked about it, had a good conversation about it. We're honest with with each other about what was going on. And we laugh about like Now we're laughing about it. It was a week ago. We laugh about it because it was kind of silly, but it was real in the moment. Yeah but it was an opportunity to forge a better relationship. I think the relationship is better because of how we handled that scenario. It could have gone way worse. I love that. So I, I, I think these things are opportunities. Yeah. I love that. All right. Kevin, let's take Dav- one or two more Kip and then close things out. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Kevin Davis. How do you establish boundaries earlier on in dating relationships? Recently I went on several dates with a woman uh, on one of the dates. She said she wanted to go, to a sit down restaurant. I asked her what type of food, sorry. Uh, she, oh my gosh, my, my mouse scroll here just jacked up. Hold on. Uh, she uh, asked her what kind of food she liked. She said she would be okay with any restaurant. I took her to the middle of the road restaurant, similar to cheesecake factory. When we got there, she immediately complained about it. Although it had a menu with many food options and, and good service. Both of us work middle-class jobs. And this was a restaurant that many middle-class folks Dine at, how would you communicate to your date that you find the behavior unacceptable, especially when she asked for your input prior to the date? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how long ago this was. If it was long ago, I yeah. think you're past the point of it's too discussing late. Yeah. it. Yeah. It, yeah. But in the moment, I, if, if, if I was taking a woman on a date and this was like our second date and she was complaining, she said, if I'm choose interested whatever in her, you want I'm, and you chose something yeah. and she's like, this is crap. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I don't know that she said. We don't know what complaining is. We don't know what she said. So That's true. That's but true. let's say she's complaining, I might say to her, if this is early on, say, "Hey, look, you you asked me to choose something. I chose something. Is there something else that you'd prefer? I'd be happy to take you there tonight." And if she says no, then say, "Oh, okay. I it just seemed like maybe you weren't ex- excited about this because you you seem like you're complaining about it." Like, why wouldn't you say that? Yeah. Like, if I'm going to take you out, I'm going to pay and you're going to complain about it, especially on the first date or two. No, no way. If it's a little bit further along in the relationship, then you can look. Is this a trend? If it's a trend, you need to nip it. Yeah. Right. You need to nip it. And you need to say, hey, hunt, look, we go out every night or every week. And every time, like you have some negative thing to say about the restaurant. So I'm going to go ahead and let you choose next week because I don't, I don't want to deal with the complaining every time I try to take you out and do something nice with you. If it's a one-off thing, it might be, she had a really bad day at work and the servers, you know, getting the brunt of it or whatever. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It just depends on what the trend line is. But yeah, I think if it's the first date or two, Again, if you're a week past it, it's kind of too late. But in the moment, I might say, hey, look, like, are you okay? Yeah. Because I thought this was a nice place. I wanted to take you out. But you, you don't seem like have you had a bad experience here before or like do you not like the food? We can go somewhere else and then give her an opportunity to voice her concern. And if she doesn't do it, then that's on her. Yeah. And if she says, yeah, I don't I don't like this place because of whatever. It's like, great. Let's go somewhere else. Or, hey, why don't you choose the restaurant next time? I'd be happy to go wherever you'd like to go. I want to make this a nice, uh, nice date for you too. Yeah. I like it, Ryan, because you're addressing the thing. You're setting the tone. Yeah. Whoa, hold on. You're complaining. I'm I'm not going to be passive in this. You're having an issue. Let's address the issue. That's how I show up in the world. And it kind of sets the tone that you're just not, 
going to let things go unaddressed. And I, I don't no like way. that a lot. And you're also not being accusatory. Yeah. Right. Because if you say, Clarifying. hey, are you OK? Because you seem like you don't seem like you're happy tonight, either with me or the restaurant or the food, like everything good. Yeah. It's, there's no accusation there. It's actually a, a, a issue of concern. Like I'm making sure you're OK. And if she says yes, you know, you have to take her out of word. Like, OK, she is OK. You, you got to be careful of, of prodding, which I will I will do. Like I will continue to do that. And that's my own insecurity speaking a lot of the times. Like, are you OK? Which is like interpreted to mean more like, are you mad at me? Are you okay with me? Is this okay? Like, give me validation. I, I will do that. I need to be very aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. All right. Uh, uh, KDA B, what advice would you give someone who knows what they need, what needs to be done, but is procrastinating, stepping up and doing it? <laughs> My first reaction was just do it, but let me give you a better answer. It's daunting when you know what needs to be done. It's so yeah, it overwhelming. overwhelming. Yeah. When I had to set up a new bank account with some trust information and businesses and things like that, and every, everything I had to do was, I was like, oh, and I didn't do it for a long time because it was just overwhelming. And then one day I sat down, I'm like, all right, this has to be done. Like, let me sit down. What are the like six things that I need to do? Okay. Well, I need to gather this document. I need to call the bank and schedule an appointment. I need to bring this document in. I need to open this account, close this account, set up this, do this, do this. Okay, so we have like eight things, right? And then I just do the one. Just do the first one, which is get the document I needed. Second one, call the bank. Okay, now you've got some momentum. You're feeling better about it. You've cranked out two of the eight things that need to be done. And you just keep working down the list. But for me, breaking it down into smaller, actionable steps always helps. I think about it in the analogy of sports because I coach a lot of my kids' sports teams. You know, if I take a young, a young kid, a young boy who's never played baseball before and I give him a bat and I'm like, hey, I'm going to throw this ball at you and it's going to be scary and I just want you to swing at it <laughs> and hit it. And he's never done it before. Hitting a baseball is one of the hardest thing in all of sports and he's never done it before. How can I expect that this is something he can accomplish? But if I say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's how you hold the bat. Here's where your feet go. And here's where you stand. That's all I need you to know right now. So grab your bat and your helmet, stand, feet, bat, grip, placement. Good. Okay. Next we go to tees. Okay. Now let me show you how to hit off a tee. Okay, then when they get proficient in that, okay, next we're going to do soft toss. So I'm tossing it to them on one knee. They get proficient at that. Okay, now I'm going to throw it underhand to you. They get proficient in that. Now I'm going to lob one to you overhand. Get proficient in that. Now I'm going to throw it a little harder. It's just bite-sized actions that are manageable for human beings to process. And when it's overwhelming, we can't process. And like any processor, if it has too much data, too much information, too much tasks it's completing, shuts down. That's what we do. I couldn't help but consider or perhaps assume that this question might even be rooted in a thing, like not a bunch of tasks, but I need to have this conversation with Ryan and I'm looking forward to it. I know I need to, but I don't want to. If it's one of those kind of things that need to be done, mm. I would suggest that you are jumping to the conclusion of what you think is going to happen versus sitting with, should it be done, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then commit to doing it and the best possible way to do it. Often I think difficult conversations that we don't wanna have sometimes or other scenarios, it's because we assume what's going to happen. Well, if I talk to Ryan, I've ring this up, then it's gonna backfire. It's like, stop. Do I need to talk with Ryan? The question is yes or no. Yes, I do. Okay, how do I do it? What's my concerns? My mm -hmm. concern is that he might perceive or look at the situation wrong. Okay, now I'm going to contrast it. So to contrast that conversation, I would say, hey, Ryan, I need to talk to you with you about something. Before we get into it though, here's my concern. I don't want you to take this conversation as me not being appreciative of everything that you've done for me. And that's the last thing I want to happen, but I'm a little fearful of that. 
in bringing this up to you. That's it. You contrast it before it even starts. And then you yeah. dive into the question. The other thing, which I probably should have mentioned first, is make sure that if this is a conversation or whatever that you, that, that you have a story around it, that you're clear on it. You're clear of the story versus the facts. That's the other problem that we often get into. I had this great conversation with a, with a leader yesterday. He was kind of sideways around this whole thing. And I said, hey, what's the facts and, and what are you making up? And he's like, oh man, I'm making up a bunch of stuff. Yeah, go into it with the facts. You're making assumptions. And if I'm not clear on that, I might even go into the assumption into the conversation with these assumptions that Ryan is X, Y, Z. And so even my tone is going to reflect that. And that's going to invite Ryan to get on his heels because I'm, a, I'm approaching the conversation from a, like an attack mode. Get straight in your head. Get straight on the facts versus perception. Use contrasting to help mitigate any potential concerns that you have. But most importantly, commit to doesn't need to be done. If it does, commit to doing it and then work on the best strategy to do so. Yeah. I also think there's something to be said for going into it with the goal of understanding. So if Kip, I need to have yeah. a conversation, maybe a, a difficult conversation with you. My objective, especially if it's initial conversation, is just to help you understand me and for me to understand better where you're coming from. Yeah. And once we have that, then you're gathering data, right? So now you're gathering information and there might just be a misunderstanding. Like we've had that. I remember yeah. we, we've had those where I'm like, yeah. hey man, I did this and I'm sorry. And here's what I was thinking, but I did this. And you're like, oh yeah, I was a little frustrated, but it's okay. Like cleared the air yeah. because I wasn't trying to prove anything. You weren't trying to prove anything. It was just like, hey, let's just get clear on this. Just a little bit of understanding. No issues. Totally. So that's been helpful too. All right, Kip, let's save the rest of the questions. We've got a lot more, I think, on Instagram. So let's save those for next week and close out today's conversation. Yeah, sounds good. So our big call to action, gentlemen, is the Iron Council is open for enrollment. <clears throat> it's going to be open for the rest of this month. Uh, to learn more about the IC or the Iron Council, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. When you join... There, you'll be part of an onboarding process where you're part of a cohort of uh, individuals preparing to join uh, teams within the IC. Your time is limited. Once again, to learn more, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. And as always, you can get your swag from the Order of Man store. That's order uh, that store dot order of man dot com. And of course, you can connect with Mr. Mickler on the gram and X at Ryan Mickler. Sweet. Appreciate it, Kip. Guys, great questions. As always, I hope we gave you something to consider. We'll be back uh, Friday for our Friday Field Notes. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.